Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, I'm trying to keep the mic at the right distance. Okay, yeah. Uh, so this session we have, uh, you know, uh, can I invite Mr. Karthik Bharatram? I, hi, Karthik. Sanjeev. Yeah. Uh, Karthik Bharatram is the Deputy Managing Director of SRF, and we have met uh, five years, yeah, five and five and five, and we don't want it to be the next, yeah, right. So Karthik, uh, can, can I request you to be seated? Yeah. Uh, I have uh, Nitin Razdan from Deloitte. Nitin? Hi. So Nitin Razdan is partner at Deloitte Consulting and, Del uh, and he's worked in several countries. He is a talent management consultant, uh, 22 countries and more, right? So uh, Nitin is an HR expert and I also have uh, Mr. Adam Cox. Adam Cox has been advisor with Corporate Executive Board. Uh, he started with uh, CEB at Ireland, then uh, North America, and then at, in, at various advisory positions. Adam, welcome. Please have a seat. And uh, can I request one more uh, uh, chair to be kept? I have one more guest who uh, I was trying to quickly coordinate while I was getting on the stage. Uh, he is stuck in traffic, but he's going to join us. So uh, you will have to pardon him for being late. Uh, traffic uh, is, is uh, we all know. Uh, Pankaj Bansal. Pankaj Bansal is a well-known figure uh, in the HR fraternity. He is the CEO of a firm called People Strong. And day before yesterday, uh, People Strong released a report which dealt with uh, not exactly workplace happiness, but something to do with uh, overall employee satisfaction, et cetera, et cetera. So Pankaj is going to join us, and uh, I have a spare chair for Pankaj, and uh, I'm going to start the session. So uh, gentlemen, uh, building on uh, Dr. Devashish Chatterjee's and Dr. Satish Manchanda's uh, the deliberation that we had in the morning, uh, I'm really confused. <laughs> Right, and, and I, I heard one of the questions which was uh, at my level of confusion. And the confusion is what exactly is happiness, right? Uh, you know, uh, world, uh, you know, Bhutan has this something called gross national happiness. The king said that we do not believe in GDP, we believe in gross national happiness. That was a construct that they gave. I look at various companies today and I, I suddenly find that a new designation has come which is called Chief Happiness Officer, right? So is that a new pathway for uh, the HR guys, right? So that's uh, the other thing. There is World Happiness Report which is released every year for the last three years now. And uh, let me try this out in the crowd. Uh, any guesses where is India in World Happiness Report? Norway tops the list. Norway, uh, the country, tops the list, but uh, where is India in World Happiness Report? 130s, that's fairly close. 122, uh, 122, right? So we ranked 122 in the World Happiness Report, and uh, that is to measure the overall happiness of the country, not of organizations. But, uh, you know, uh, gentlemen, we have a very uh, uh, elevated panel of people who are working at a topmost level of the organization, and I really want to benefit from, from your presence and ask the same question to all of you. Define happiness in the, in the, in the, construct, of world, uh, in the construct of workplaces. So, uh, shall I, uh, Karthik, will you take the first shot? Uh, it is afternoon. Good afternoon, friends. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, we saw in the previous panel, defining happiness is never an easy uh, subject. Um, I think, frankly, when, it, when you look at it from an individual's perspective, happiness can mean different things to different people. For me, happiness is playing golf. Uh, for somebody else, it could be anything else, right? But uh, it, it's, it's different for each person. I think when it comes to a corporate, um, for example, in our company, SRF Limited, we actually have a happiness index 
and we measure this on a monthly basis. So there's a snap poll of sorts which is done on our internet portal. And we ask uh, each person to rate where they are on a happiness index. And here we don't, we don't get worried in terms of if one month turns out to be a red versus a yellow or anything else. But we look at the trends over a period of time. And then we act upon it if we feel there's a person who's constantly in red or somebody who's moved from green, which is supposed to be happy, to uh, unhappy. Um, just, just to tell you, as an organization, uh, we are at about 40% happy, 50% I'm okay, and about 10% people saying I'm unhappy. Okay, so uh, we do do counseling, we do go talk to the people who are unhappy if we find there's a trend of unhappiness over a period of time. In terms of how we define uh, the concept of happiness, we've taken various things into consideration that we ask people. So, I mean, or rather let me put it this way, there are various things that we do as an organization to try and ensure happiness of the individual. So one is clarity of role. We have found that if people are clear about what their uh, objectives are, what their responsibilities, accountabilities are, they are a lot happier. Uh, obviously, policies which are very standard across organizations in terms of people saying what are the fr um, employee friendly policies, etc., make a difference. Uh, we do believe we have a caring culture in the organization, which means that um, God forbid if anybody is going through any sort of negative thing, any sort of trauma and all, we like an organi as an organization, uh, not just as individuals, like to come and help that person out. We have something called a death and disability policy. We have various policies to help people out in tough times. Okay? Uh, obviously, empowerment is another big thing. How much can you empower people? Now, even on this, we have a mixed bag within our own company. But our CEOs, we know uh, for a fact, are trying to push people to say, stop CCing me on mails if I don't need to be CC'd on it. You guys take the call. This is your delegation of power. You take the call. Don't push it up to me just so that you know, you say, he saw it as well, so he must have ratified it. So we, huh? Upward, upward delegation, right? And that's sort of save my backside sort of situation. But we try and push it down and say, it's your call. Don't push it up, OK? I mean, there are various things than the reputation of the organization. What we found when we've spoken to people, the CSR work that we do as a foundation, our foundation does, has a huge impact in terms of how happy fe people feel being a part of our organization. So they say if this organization has a good reputation by doing a lot of good work with the rural education, etc., we feel good about it. Uh, Shiram School is a sister body. That leads to a lot of uh, goodwill for our uh, organization. Uh, uh, because obviously with the sort of name, brand, and the sort of kids that come out of there, people speak highly of our organization as well. And it makes our employees happy to be associated with it. So, and finally, basic infrastructure, well-being, etc. these are things that you have to have. These are the hygiene factors. And at the end of the day, we ask employees, are you happy to come to work or not? Or is it, oh Lord, it's a Monday sort of situation. So that's it. Kartik, fantastic. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, I was waiting for that uh, huge round of applause that SRF <laughs> measures, that SRF measures happiness on a monthly basis. I think that deserves, you know, that's, uh, you know, uh, it was something that we never, the world never knew, right? And that you're doing so, so uh, regularly. And all the things that you mentioned about volunteerism, which leads to, to happiness. And uh, Dr. Chatterjee described happiness, the various sorts of things which, which leads to happiness. Uh, Nitin, because I want to have uh, more of the Indian context, and then I'll uh, come to you, Adam. Uh, uh, so Nitin, uh, you have been working with uh, various <coughs> corporates, multiple uh, all across uh, 22 countries, and also in India. Uh, how do organizations see this whole construct of happiness? Sure, and I think, um, you know, Karthik summarized this very beautifully, and you can trust a consultant to have a framework around everything, which is, <laughs> which is what I'm about to explain. Uh, you know, a two by two or a yeah, three by three. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, at, uh, at Deloitte, a lot of, uh, of the fellow HR practitioners might have heard of George Burson, uh, you know, the Burson by Deloitte brand, which is a sort of preeminent uh, research authority on multiple HR topics in the world. And um, 
you know, we've been trying uh, as a firm to distill this for our clients, you know, what's the difference between engagement, happiness, etc. And in a sense, we've come up with um, a model called the simply irresistible organization, right? So what is it that makes an, organi an organization simply irresistible for people working there? And there were, you know, five key tenets of that, right? The first was around meaningful work, right? right? And meaningful work really boils down to, um, you know, are people, uh, do we have the right people in the right jobs uh, with a match in terms of the people's skills, strengths, and aspirations with the work they're doing, right? Um, and are they sufficiently empowered enough, you know, to take decisions in that job? The second one is really around supportive management. And supportive management has a lot to do with, well, you know, what Karthik was describing earlier, um, you know, providing role clarity, uh, providing coaching, providing mentorship, um, but also um, providing constant feedback, right, around performance and, me you know, measuring it, right? And the world over, there's been a trend over the last two or three years to say that you know, let's dump the bell curve, let's potentially dump ratings. We've been experimenting with that at Deloitte, in fact. And, you know, let's build performance management systems which are playing to people's strengths and which are forward-looking rather than performance management systems which are backward-looking report cards uh, which actually end up beating people up because of their weaknesses. So the second, as I said, was, you know, supportive management. The third was a positive work environment and, again, um, Positive work environment really is about inclusivity. It's about respectfulness. It's about being humane. Um, you know, in in the way uh, leaders conduct themselves, in the in the way policies are designed. Again, as you know, Karthik alluded to. The fourth was around growth opportunity, and you know, again, this is a big one considering that you know we will soon have the largest millennial workforce in the world in this country. You know. I think in the next decade, we'll have more, more than a billion people under the age of 35 in the workforce. And, um, you know, growth, growth opportunity really refers to uh, how much am I learning on the job? You know, um, uh, you know how fast can I accelerate my career growth? Uh, does the organization provide me with avenues to, you know, try different things? Uh, the final piece was around trust in leadership. And I guess this boils down to a sense of authenticity, uh, transparency in communication. Uh, you know, so are you know are leaders demonstrating those behaviors which uh, which would make them come across as uh, trustworthy uh, and credible to the you know rest of the organization? So these were the top 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 five in the sort of sim simply ir irresistible organization framework. There is a sixth one which also kind of uh, which also kind of um, kind of uh, it can be overlaid and cuts across the top top five, which is you know, does the organization actually provide the right resources and infrastructure to people for them to do their jobs, right? So right. it could yeah. be down, you know, right down to uh, things as basic as IT infrastructure or, uh, you know, um, a desk or a workplace which, which uh, is ergonomically designed. Yeah. So uh, before I uh, move to Adam, Nitin, a follow-on question, because most of the things that uh, you spoke about, I, and it falls under the... Uh, construct of uh, employee engagement. So how would you see workplace happiness as a different or a, uh, let me, uh, my personal view could be uh, it's more elevated construct than employee engagement. How, how are these two different? Uh, to be honest, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure if they are. I mean, I, I would, I, I mean, I would imagine there is a strong correlation between both. Okay. Right? I mean, I would be surprised if you said, um, you know, the, we have a very engaged workforce, but they're unhappy. Right. Or, you know, vice versa, very disengaged workforce, but they're very happy. Right? Um, so, so, I mean, without getting into the semantics or right. uh, the labels, I, I would definitely imagine there's a strong correlation with both. Okay. So, uh, get your point. Uh, by the way, uh, we, we conducted a very quick dipstick, uh, about 350 people, 350 plus, they have uh, responded. And uh, uh, there are two questions uh, which sort of, uh, and we asked multiple questions out of uh, which I really want to talk about two questions. One, are you happy in life? And then we also asked another question, are you happy at your workplace? 
So before I give the answer, can I have the response from crowd? Do you think it's fairly correlated? There would be differences? What sort of uh, uh, differences would you get? So the first question was, and I think this was debated, uh, this, was, this was spoken to by uh, Dr. Manchanda, that uh, we have to talk about happiness in life in general, right? Uh, and in that survey, we had another question that, uh, how happy are you at your workplace? Any sense from uh, all the, you, we have so many, uh, the, the room is full. Uh, I'm looking for some answers. You are happy in life? Can you raise your hands? Wow, that's about uh, 60%. And uh, happy at workplace? Nearly there, it's, it's, it's about 50%, right? Uh, and that sort of throws up the difference, right? Uh, and Adam, yes. so I would like to build this up, but uh, mm. could you throw the global perspective on workplace happiness? And because you are from the UK, I, I, uh, I recently, uh, you know, uh, this news, this is big news which came, other than Brexit, that UK now has a lady who is a loneliness minister. Mm -hmm. Correct. Right? Uh, yeah, tell us about it. Absolutely. Um, the launching of the um, loneliness minister, I have a lapel, but thank you, um, uh, is a relatively new initiative. Um, I've been based in the UK for 10 years, and so I'm now getting a little bit of a grip of the culture. And if any of you have had the opportunity of spending time in the United Kingdom, you will understand that culturally there are some sensitivities, some horrible generalizations I'm about to make about a culture, which I know are always not completely correct. Um, very diplomatic, yeah. quite introverted, um, very self kind of protective, do not open up. Subsequently, a trend that has evolved that even I was aware of when I was a child in the UK was this trend of loneliness in the elderly. As I get older, spouses pass away, the culture in another horrible generalization, uh, most of the West is the culture around the individual. Leave home, get the job, my car's bigger than yours, these sort of things. Um, it pushes people and family out the door. To contrast that to this country, this is my 12th time in India, so I'm now slowly getting a bit of a grip. Uh, earlier this week, I was um, being housed uh, by a family in Tamil Nadu, which had five generations, which to me as a Westerner is alien. I live in a house of one, me, and, and the cat. And you walk downstairs, and it's chaos, but it's orderly chaos, and it works, and it's this unit. And as I look at the cultural differences around the individuals, and then I apply those observations to my work globally. Um, I've worked in 91 countries. I've seen a vast majority of cultures and the nuances in them and what it means to the workplace. A couple of what I believe are universal truths in relation to happiness. The first one is happiness is idiosyncratic. It means very different things to very different people. And that needs to be accepted by talent and HR professionals when approaching what happiness means in the organization and what initiatives uh, should be launched. To build on that point, there is also a time-based evolution within those individuals. So your version of happiness and my version of happiness may be very different, but it'll also be different through different stages of our personal and professional career. When I was 16, starting a career, happiness was the paycheck and my friends and party and doing crazy things on the weekend, and I was happy. Mid-career, it is not about the money, it is about valuable work, contribution, meaning, and I guarantee that that will change as time goes on. A great observation that I saw when I was doing some one work with an organization, they wanted to reward the top salespeople, and they wanted to make them happy. We love our salespeople, they are the economic powerhouse of this organization, global enterprise, what we will do is that for the top 3% uh, of salespeople in the organization, all expensive paid trip paid to Paris. Let's go, we'll put it on, all the dinners, travel, beautiful. And um, this was uh, an, an initiative between the strategy department, the CEO's office, and, um, and the high performer uh, division of, of uh, HR. And it launched out, and they're like, this is great, everyone's gonna be happy, we're gonna build motivation, motivate the sales team, it's kind of a goal for many organizations. 
Anyway, to cut a long story short, there was great resistance from some of the winners of this program. There was one particular individual. He was the highest salesperson on the continent of Africa. He was based in Rwanda. Because of his success, he had gained material wealth. There had been immense jealousy within the community. People were robbing his house. They were hassling his children at school. You think you're better than us. You come from money, uh, this sort of thing. And here comes the note from corporate. You've been summoned to Paris. Happiness. I actually got the opportunity to speak to that individual six months later when I was doing some work in Rwanda. And he's like, that is the worst possible thing the company could do. I want security, safety for my family. I want to find better ways I can be remunerated as opposed to a repeating bag of money showing up every Friday. I'm not going to leave my family and go to Paris, but you must come, you will be happy. A complete misalignment. So when it comes to the purpose of happiness and what it actually means, the first pill that must be swallowed by organizations is the acceptance that happiness is idiosyncratic. Fantastic and very, very insightful, Adam. And uh, uh, it sort of resonates with the survey that we uh, conducted. And uh, something which is very interesting is uh, 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 we captured a few of the demographic data and uh, uh, so people who are in the 20s, they are most happy. And people who are in the 50s, they are most happy. But it sort of dips for the people who are in their 30s. So uh, when I look at this survey data, so uh, it's like a, it's like a, a U-shape uh, uh, sort of uh, on the age profile and happiness index, if you, if you plot. Uh, so people in the 20s are happy. Their needs are different. Uh, they should get their salary. Paycheck is more important. And people who are in the 30s and 40s, uh, the response is, I want more respect. I want to be respected at workplace. I want to be heard. I want better colleagues. And those sort of stuff uh, which is coming out of their data. Right? Uh, uh, so uh, building upon all the things that uh, uh, all three of you have said, uh, Karthik, uh, what are the implications if we have this, def and, and you have a very broad-based, uh, and you have very nice uh, happiness index. Uh, what are the steps that organizations like SRF or any other organization that uh, uh, both of you can talk about, what should they do to nurture happiness at workplace? So I think as Adam mentioned, this is becoming a tougher and tougher challenge given that you have different generations at work now. So it's not just about millennials and trying to make your uh, manufacturing, for us, a manufacturing concern look like Google, uh, all sexy if you can call it that, uh, so that the millennials feel good about it. The fact is uh, we have baby boomers, we have uh, uh, Gen X, Gen Y, we have this whole mix of people. Right. So one of the struggles that uh, we are having and we are trying to deal with is trying to figure out what will make each person happy. So, and, but unfortunately, uh, in a decent sized corporation, it's very difficult to have different policies for everyone. Uh, so you can't say for millenni millennials, I will do this in terms of remuneration or something else. And for somebody who's older, I will provide security or something. Uh, and I understand, Adam, even where the company was possibly coming for that it's difficult for them to yeah. even think of the concept of right? yeah. geographically doing very different things in different places. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, uh, we, we know for a fact, like for example, we have Thailand and South Africa as well where we have plants. And policies have to be tweaked a little bit in terms of what they value versus uh, what they value in India. But that's still slightly easier when you look at it at a geographical level rather than then say, within my Gurgaon office, 20% uh, of people would like this, the rest would like this. We are trying to see, and this is still work in progress, whether we can bring in some flexibility into our policies, but it's still very early for us. So I mean, I don't really have an answer right now in terms of how to make each person happy from a company policy perspective, but basic things in terms of, like I mentioned earlier, growth, providing good managers, good teams, uh, having a good culture, these are more sort of, I hate to say, generic things that we can do to ensure that the general happiness 
quotient is decent in the organization. It's not getting to that individual level, but it's at a broader level that we are working on happiness. Getting to the individual level would really be the next challenge that we would have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Nitin, uh, I would like to rephrase question a little differently, and, uh, and the question could be really different. Uh, so one of the challenge. Yeah, consultants, right? Bring it. So, so one of you the one of the voice. one of the real yeah, challenge, <laughs> one of the real challenge, that an employee faces in a country like India, more in a country like India as compared to Europe, and uh, there is a criticism uh, about the European policies oh, yeah. also, is uh, in a digital world you are working always. Your work starts at six o'clock in the morning; it keeps on going till ten o'clock in the night. So the messages are there; reports have to be sent. Uh, uh, I just, uh, you know, uh, saw someone very close working for last seven days, uh, uh, completely absorbed in, in, in uh, corporate matters right from 6 o'clock to 10, uh, right, this sort of stuff. Now, Europe has come out with this policy, and most of the European countries, that no emails after 6. No emails after 6. So, in France and in Germany, you cannot send official emails after 6 o'clock. And this relates to a much deeper question, which is linked to corporate stress or the stress in employees. Because if you're uh, continuously on, on, on your work, on your mobile and uh, on your smartphones and devices and always working on, on something, right, Excel sheets, PowerPoints, etc., or whatever, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, are we going to see this in India? Nathan. My short answer is, is no. Right. Um, it sounds very utopian. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't see, I wouldn't foresee a policy intervention which would prohibit emails after a certain hour um, being implemented in India. Um, you know, that being said, I think, um, and you know, we are in a sector again where we serve client needs across time okay. zones, across sectors. It's a very always on culture. Yeah. You know, I'm sitting here on a stage for an hour. I'll be fidgety when I step back and start checking my emails. Mm. That's the reality. Uh, it's, it is an always on culture. Um, but uh, I, I think, uh, you know, two, two, two levers to worth, uh, you know, which are worth thinking about here. Um, one is um, a bit of self-control. Right. Um, you know, I, uh, for example, do have a habit of ensuring that um, when I'm having dinner and my dinner is with my family and my three-year-old daughter um, and my wife, there are no phones on the table. Right. Uh, in fact, I deliberately put it in a charger in another room so that I don't hear the buzz and start freaking out. Right. So just, you know, those windows in the day where you can just black out. In fact, I love being on a flight for the sole reason that nobody can reach me. Yep. Even that's changing now, though. I mean, a lot of long-haul flights now have Wi-Fi. <laughs> yeah. I deliberately don't subscribe to it. So self-control is important, and I guess to some extent, the second thing is leadership behavior is also important because, you know, if I have a yep. colleague on vacation, and if I'm, you know, sending mails to him or her and then expecting a response while they're on vacation, you know, I'm setting a wrong precedent. Right. Fantastic. So. A great example, right? Mm. Yeah. Adam, yes. so, so uh, you know, uh, we know the European answer. Yes. Right. Uh, I have a different question for you. Okay. That's it. St workplace stress. So, so all of us are, you know, high performers. They, they sort of uh, are always chasing the bigger targets. And many, uh, many often these targets are driven by managers. So one of the uh, survey responses which came and it looked like someone from sales, yaar boss ko roj roj sales target ko chase karne ke liye mana karo. Which means that the boss shouldn't be chasing the sales target with me daily on a daily basis. Yes. Right? And yeah. that sort of uh, is a refrain which says that uh, someone is chasing and it's uh, sort of adding uh, stress uh, into the person. Yes. Right? So, uh, so the question is, uh, is how do you bridge this paradigm, uh, this conflicting paradigm of uh, performance mm -hmm. and happiness. Perfect, great or, or, question. Or a higher target and, yeah. and happiness. Great question. So, ultimately there are two types of leadership. There is authority 
and there is influence. And I assert that influence has a higher impact on organizational culture. For example, I have been in organizations where there are internal communications. We are a happy organization. We don't check emails after six o'clock. We do all these things. We link arms and we're unified, one enterprise. We all have heard this. The best definition of culture I have ever encountered is that the culture is defined by the way employees perceive the last visible internal promotion. For example, posters on the wall, happy organization. Um, here is this individual, he or she is a ruthless salesperson, goes around the manager, gets things approved by finance under the table, the top performer, the lone wolf. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're not following you know, the internal governance and the spirit of the organization. You know, they'll you know, put in the knife behind other people's, other salespeople's back to win the business. But you have internal relations and HR and comms and everyone kind of you know, singing the right song in relation to the journey of the enterprise and where we are going. And then that individual is promoted. What message does that send? The visible process of that promotion is the culture. And that gives context to the individual and context is paramount for defining happiness. So when it comes to bridging this performance culture and the happiness quotient and all the good things that we're discussing today, we really need to ensure that as leaders, both influence and authority, we say what we mean and we mean what we say. And that is what is missing where we see that dimension. So great point, Adam, uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, to all the uh, people in the audience, uh, if you have any questions, you can, uh, you can, uh, in, in, I'll, I'll have one more question, and after that, if you have any questions, I've noted one Sanjeev, of the hands right can now. can I just add something yeah. to what yes. Nitin had said earlier, in terms of, and what you had said, in terms of really a 24-7 workplace yeah. now, and people having to, you know, possibly, as I think who, who somebody mentions last seven days, somebody's been working on a project or whatever, yeah, right? Came, yeah. I think a lot, when you talk, talk about happiness in an organization, I think you have to look at the DNA of the organization and the DNA of the person you're going to recruit. If that is very different, if there's a mismatch in that, then that person is not going to be happy in your organization. So for us, for example, uh, work-life balance is important. So right. if there was this one guy who's going to probably stay there till 7.38 at night, he's going to find it a mismatch because everybody would have left by 6.30 or so because work-life balance is pushed. So we do push people that, you know, please make sure there's a balance. Uh, and then when we recruit people, we try and see who are the sort of people who are going to be happy to be here. So we may go to a tier two university or something, pick up the toppers from there, from small towns, because for them to come to a big town, work in a well-reputed company is a big thing, something that they right. feel inherently happy about. Yeah. So these are some of the things that we look at. We try to create a genome in terms of what is the ideal candidate for our organization. And, yeah. and you see, uh, you try and see, not officially saying from the happiness lens, but there is a process through which you see the fitment. The fit, the fit the is culture. better, the engagement, the fit, right. et cetera, with the, with the, is better. With the culture. Yeah. Yeah. you wanted to add in. Absolutely, the goodness of fit is important, but what is interesting over the last couple of years, at least from my observation, is we're slowly seeing the decline in the recruitment process of people trying to evaluate discretionary effort. Because discretionary effort caters to the culture of working the overtime, putting in the hard yards, being in the office on Saturday. So be mindful within the context of the Indian culture and the Indian organization. It's, you know, discretionary effort has always been a big anchor to go, yeah, it's a test of grit, it's a test of character, you know, employ for character, train for skill, these sort of you know, basic fundamentals which go in and out of fashion. But to your point, I agree with it's, you. it's this interesting kind of diametrically opposed tension. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Pankaj Bansal. I have introduced Pankaj before. Uh, first of all, Pankaj, uh, sincere thanks for uh, you know, still making it. 
uh, on this, uh, you know, uh, Pankaj has been texting me that uh, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, and those sort of stuff, uh, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Pankaj, uh, uh, very simple question. Uh, day before yesterday, I think you released your report, right? And uh, uh, tell us about how would people strong define workplace happiness, and uh, what all are you do? Uh, what 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 are you doing about this? So, uh, so thank you. You know, first, first, let me tell you that uh, if you if you accept the things as they are, and you forgive others, things are happy. So I'm accepting that I'm late, and you forgive me, and you forgive me. It'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. So I think it'll Forgiven. be much easier. We right? are all happy that you're here. So, so yeah, thank you so much. So I think uh, that's the context. It was beyond my control, and I told him 12:30. I'm I'm really sorry. Coming back to uh, to the subject. So we do this uh, study with Business Today every year called Best Companies to Work for. This is the seventh year uh, People Strong was doing it. Um, if, I, if I go back in history, um, Sanjeev, if you look at the way the whole thing has been designed, the right. first year it came up that most admired companies, and I'll not name any company, but one of India's top organization came up. Most admired companies are not the best places to work. Right? All right. That's As interesting. As we progressed, you know, very interesting <laughs> thing. As we progressed, we realized people asked the second question, and they said that boss is not the god, right? on contrary to what Gallup said all the life, that you know you are driven by the supervisory experience. People contested it and they said, we, we called it casualty of boss, if you remember that Business Today famous edition. Uh, third thing that we realized where people started talking of uh, ethical boards and management, that was the big ask that employees had. But the latest report which we just launched with industry minister in, in Delhi, a lot of fanfare, a lot of CHROs, most interesting point that came up is that employees are asking very deeper questions for the first time. They are saying, okay, compensation is important, growth is important, good work culture is important. That means a good job. I'm happy. But I will not claim you or I will not tell you that you are the best companies to work for if you give me these three things. These three things makes my job more meaningful. Right. That doesn't make you a great place to work. What makes you a great place to work if you're inclusive and fair, number one, you don't have huge hierarchies, number two, Right. And number three, you are giving me opportunity to innovate. So are you seeing? So they are differentiating first time between a job and an organization. For years, like like me, I'm sure many HR professionals who are here, I see professor sitting here. So many of you, I'm sure, would relate that a lot of time we thought job and organizations synonymously, which is not the case that we heard in this time. And final headline, if I give, uh, the most surprising part was about women. So I always look at the happiness or great places to work or whatever you want to call in the context of cohorts, right? right. So women are completely rejecting the so-called men's world and twice, uh, two out of five women are saying that we reject the pay parity. This is the biggest ask from women. They are saying we, uh, we don't like, we dislike being not equal just on the basis of gender. This is the first time in the last eight years this has come so strongly. And, uh, and I'll close on one concept at a very personal level, friends. I believe, please, please don't mind, it's, everything is fine, Western or Indian. But I feel happiness is a very Western concept, right? And, and we adopted it blindly. We must learn from the West the beautiful things they have done. However, our context was never about happiness. Think of your grandparents. Did they ever talk about happiness or contentment? You know, the India, I, I, I'm, I'm sitting with him, I know a, a bit of a Bharat Ram family, if you look at the concept was never about happiness. It was about contentment. If you're contentment, happiness is an outcome, right? right? So I think we are just blindly getting mad about this happiness, right? Not, I'm not saying happiness is not required, but I think it's the contentment, the Indian way if we approach, we'll be able to make a far more meaningful impact, is my Fantastic, point. Completely uh, agree. and great point, I think. So contentment is something that I really believe in, and I think you made the point, uh, and that's the, the, the long Indian culture, right? Uh, uh, the industrial world sort of imposed its own ways of working, and, and, and then you had this uh, something called Hawthorne effects, and right, all the studies which are there in industrial psychology, and, and then happiness uh, uh, is one of the outcomes of how do we move forward, but contentment, uh, great point. Uh, I really like the last one of the points which you uh, mentioned, Pankaj, uh, was about women uh, making it loud and clear that uh, pay parity, uh, uh, you know, inequity in pay is something that uh, they did, that they don't that they don't want. But there's something uh, very interesting from uh, the outcome of the survey that we conducted for Straight Drive, and which is uh, 
which is more women want to be respected at workplace as compared to men. And the point differential is, uh, uh, is almost 50% higher. And which sort of uh, is the ask that women is trying to make at the workplace? So if you look at it, I think, again, I, I just quoted an example because this was fresh. You asked me to quote the report. But uh, again, I have a very strong opinion. We should not build organizational strategies based too much on cohorts. Give equality, but not only women. Everyone will ask for it, right? I quoted you a data of for women. So, so there are authors and poets who spoke about happiness, right? There are spiritual leaders who speak about happiness, and there are philosophers. Right. But we all ignore the fourth category, which is scientists, mm -hmm. right? Scientists also talk, and in the world of corporate, the other three doesn't have much say. Correct? I, I may love Urdu poetry, but it has no meaning in a corporate context. If you look at from a scientist view, e, be it women or men, they are asking for four liquids or chemicals which get distributed in our head, right? You know about that? I know the names are very technical, so I'm not getting into detail. But even one minute, if I tell you, their decoding of happiness says comes from four things. Right. One, if you take care of your body. So if you exercise, if you start gymming, yoga, you start liking it, right? You get addicted to it. But at some point of time, it stops giving you happiness. Second is achievement. If the work you do, the vocation or profession you have should give you happiness. That's the second thing. Once you achieve both of them, still you start feeling a little bored with it. Third comes when your relationships in life, and a big Harvard study talks on the relationships. That becomes yeah. the key. But even if you have all the three, you still feel a vacuum in life. And the ultimate they talk about is giving to others. They say if your life has a balance between the four, and I'm talking very scientifically, I know we come from a very rational world, though I'm an ardent follower of Bhagavad Gita, and I can go that side, but it won't be very relevant here to this audience. But I'm saying these are the four scientific reasons that, uh, that scientists talk about. So it's not really men, women, which we have increased, uh, but that's a big point we need to bring in parity across. All right. So uh, yeah. fair point, and great point uh, that you made. So, I see hands uh, there. Uh, yeah. Madam, can you go first? You want a mic? Can I yeah. come there he and comes on. hand over the mic? Please, <laughs> please. Train mic, sir. Hello, hello. Yeah. My name is Radha Sharma. Uh, I'm professor and dean at Management Development Institute, Gurgram. Since uh, there is talk of science and research and a lot of surveys are being quoted, I couldn't resist my temptation to share some of the research that I have done or I have been uh, associating with, with All people right. from Manchester Business School. We have Adam from uh, UK. Uh, there is one question and maybe two observations. My question to Adam would be, uh, in UK, you have a couple of laws regarding working hours, workload, EAP, employee assistance programs, which are mandatory. And every organization has to do these kinds of surveys periodically. And uh, it's required by the government, right? right. So my question was, uh, has it brought a difference? Uh, have the organizations and employees become happier places to work? Uh, then the two observations. The other, I have recently published a book with Professor Carrie Cooper on executive burnout. I work on positive psychology and also on the negative side. Uh, this research of mine was funded by WHO, and uh, I collected data from 71 companies, both manufacturing and service from across India, developed a measure which was clinically validated by cardiologists, psychiatrists, and clinical psychologists from All India Institute of Medical Sciences. Uh, well, that was quite some time back. Uh, and this research of mine, having identified the people who were burning out, uh, and we provided intervention, we found that none of the factors of happiness, of course, that would, they are very important and valid. Uh, in the Indian context, I found spiritual interventions made, did make a difference. Spiritual interventions. Spiritual interventions did make a difference. All right. And we had scientific data on scientists, engineers, accountants, and all kinds of professionals from across the industry. And we did intensive experimental study as well. And we did find that difference, so which was not actually relating to the work and you know, work-related parameters, but it was relating to self. But all that, given that environment, people were still feeling better after that intervention. And I'm tempted uh, with the last remark made by you and uh, Pankaj. Uh, you, 
a lot of talk about gender equality and so on and so forth. Uh, I've been part of it nationally and internationally. I'm ambassador, GDO ambassador at the Academy of Management, gender diversity in organization. And it's a rhetoric. But my research, which I published in an A category journal, this was not on equality, it was on equity. 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 So okay. gender equality is different from gender equity. Right. The West talks about gender equality, parity in pay, right to vote, this, this, this. Indian constitution provides gender equality. Despite equality, there is inequity in the organization, which is affecting their happiness. That's what my scientific data published in Frontiers in Psychology, which is a category journal. So this is what I wanted to share. It affected their employee engagement as well. Thank you. Thank you, very, thank you very much, madam. And I think you deserve a round of applause for yeah. all the work. <laughs> I have a gentleman in the back, yeah. yeah. Well, we have a couple of questions uh, we have to respond to. Yeah, do you want the, to Yeah, I'll do it very quickly. Yeah. Um, you, your question in relation to these laws in different countries, have they made an impact? The answer is a firm no. Uh, a lot of the laws and the reporting that is required is self-certification. Um, I was working for an unnamed company in the last week. I was in seat. I did 112 hours. No one flinched. Standard. The certification process, the outcome of that and what the governments in some of the policies are calling for is show intent to improve. Adam worked 112 hours. We're going to have a talk with him. Kick the report in. Done. It's, it doesn't hold water. So that's, uh, that's probably the first that point. Yeah. Yeah, so firstly, this man, woman, there's an Urdu poet who said, and I'm tempted, he said, hum hum hai to kya hum hai, tum hi tum ho to kya tum ho. Right? So <laughs> let's keep this story aside for minutes, right? And if I respond in two parts, ma'am, I think uh, laws have never given happiness to anyone. Mm -hmm. The implementation of laws has. You undermine the state when the law is formed and it's not followed. The same story for Indian constitution. Our constitution is not bad. So that's one point. Second is coming to spiritual interventions. I firmly believe that's the only way going forward. There is no other way. We should dump other things. Even at People Strong, we have something called PGP, philosophy, goal, and purpose. So we have basically identified three things. I'm not going to get into details. But the results that I saw, small thing from a group of 20 people losing about 120 kgs together and moving to their higher productivity to multiple things. The cases that we have seen, if you do a standalone very physical, material, outcome-oriented program vis-a-vis -a, -vis a spiritual intervention, well connected to the business, gives far better results. So I'm, I'm with you for that. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a ton, Pankaj. Uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, organizers, how much time do we have? Uh, we're, I, we're, we're done. Right. So one question and uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot, uh, this panel is for bringing realities here. And we are discussing realities. Uh, as Dr. mentioned, that old, now we are moving from workplace to overall. Uh, I am conceptualizing one thing from the discussions. I want uh, some, uh, you could throw your lights on that. Uh, the conceptualization was there is an individual. Every individual in any organization varies and it is having certain aspirations or happiness. And that is an organization, the place where he is working organization or institution like family, religion, whatever he is having. So the conceptualization map which I am having in my mind, individual and institutions. So happiness at individual level and it varies and happiness at workplace, here we are talking about workplace and at family and an institution. So is it uh, important to look these both dimensions for an individual and organization to be happy and progressive and whatever we could say? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great question. So yeah, you want to absolutely. Um, with with a lot of the organisations I have worked with, it is very a similar approach. But I'm just going to take your question and twist it a little bit. Um, there's been a lot of work that's becoming quite popular in the West by uh, Angela Duckworth of the University of Pennsylvania. She's written a book on grit. It's a bestseller in North America and other places. It's a great book. And one of the elements it talks to is about what is your grit equation. There are elements that go into creating grit. There has been a lot of conversation since the publishing of that work in relation to the same conversation and the question that you just asked. What is the individual's equation for happiness? Is it love and money? Is it hard work 
and recognition. It's different for different people. Equally, on the organization side, what is the equation for success? The move of the general consensus, at least what I have seen, is people are now, you know, HR is now moving away from this idea that talent equals success. I employ this individual, they are the best performer on paper, that is obvious, therefore we get them in seat, we give them the resources, and we will succeed at execution of our strategy. People are moving away from that to go, okay, what is our definition and our equation for success as an organization? It is, it is, it, it's changing. So it's breaking precisely your assertion, your model down, but looking at it from an equation perspective, because the company looks for success, and yes, there is a happiness element to it. The individual is looking for happiness, and yes, there is a success element to it. And trying to find that middle balance between where you can get elements of the equation to overlap, and that starts to become looking like the framework for how you'd move it forward. Can I? Yeah, I mean, I'd also encourage you to read the re research of this uh, professor called Dr. David McClelland. Dr. David McClelland was uh, a renowned guru of psychology uh, at Harvard. Uh, and he, he had done path-breaking research around human behavior, uh, competencies, uh, motives and drivers, and dating back to the 60s. And, uh, you know, if you really look at... Um, uh, you know, human motives, he had de defined them in, in, in three parameters. You know, the, the need for achievement, the need for affiliation, and the need for power, right? And different people are wired differently. So there are people who are over-indexed on achievement, that's just who they are. Uh, and they may not, uh, for example, value affiliation. Affiliation is all about relationships. There are people who would be over indexed on perhaps power and achievement and maybe low on affiliation or vice versa. Right? And actually there are, uh, there are uh, tests available for, for human beings to test their motives because it, 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 is, a, it, it is a good uh, deep reflection of you know, who you individually are. Um, uh, in an Indian context, the only thing I would also add is we are a, we are a society unfortunately which, um, which um, often is pressurized by comparisons, okay? And that comparison pressure kicks in from childhood. Um, and then, you know, when you grow up, you're comparing your, 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 your you know, board marks, your 12th marks, which college did your neighbors, uh, uh, you know, kids get into, um, all the way to, you know, which company did you crack when you gra graduate from business school. Um, and even with Indian millennials, frankly, that, that you know, comparison mi uh, mindset hasn't changed. Uh, that obsession for titles hasn't changed. Yeah. Hi, Shivish. This is very, uh, if you allow right. me, it's a highly relevant question for them. Can you speak louder? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, as like we are, uh, hi, I'm Ravi. I come from Observe and I work in a digital transformation on the field. I just want to uh, ask a question that right now we are talking about happiness being personalized. There are a variety of happiness being personalized. There are a variety of dimensions in which the happiness uh, is uh, like diverse and which are being recognized as well. And nowadays, as our, as our life has become more and more virtual, we have become digital. We have more than 40% of our time spending on digital media or right. uh, uh, any other aspect. With the help of science and technology, we are able to analyze every movement or every, every personality what we have, kind of a DNA could be one of the things. So if like so much data is around, so much digitalization is around, can we create, a, create an experience in any organization or in the world where we can actually help every individual to be happy as per his equation or, or as per his context. So, uh, Ravi, a uh, fantastic question. Adam. Uh, Let's have one uh, quick thought because I'm mindful of time. So, uh, two line thought. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. um, th there is a mode of thinking starting to emerge that emotions are just data. And if you are self aware enough to look at your emotions independently, mine it for insight, you do not have to subscribe to the instruction of the emotion. So precisely your assertion in relation to data, you're doing it within the individual psychologically. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm fully aware that you have more questions. Uh, lunch is around the corner. Uh, everyone, all the speakers and all of us are going to be here. Uh, let's uh, talk more uh, while we are there. But uh, uh, to all of you, uh, thank you from bottom heart. 
Uh, Mukund, uh, this is uh, fantastic. Uh, the topic is fantastic. The, uh, uh, I think one suggestion which has come and, and, and from all of us, endorsed by all of us, which is for, uh, and also from Madam, uh, which is uh, the work to be done, is, is uh, and I'm taking it as a homework, uh, is taking spirituality to workplace, right? Uh, because if spirituality is the, uh, is the root to, or is the core of happiness, I think organizations ought to think deeply about it, right? Uh, once again, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for your time. Uh